so, the three parts of my life history that uh, relate to what I might read today are that I was an archaeologist for 18 years, so there are quite a few poems about archaeology. The boating thing that Janet's just mentioned, um, which is that I live on a boat and have done for a long time, so I write about that a fair bit. Uh, and then my immense and complex, rich history of dysfunctional personal relationships, which uh, I like to say it's not pain, it's raw material. Uh, so there's a bit of that as well. So there will be some watery poems here, but there may be some language that Alice Oswald would be very unlikely to use. Uh, so we'll start with one of those. I'll just get a glass of water if you hang on for a second. We have to go down all those stairs to get this. So how many of you didn't know that you were coming to see me and Greville when you stepped into this building? How are you feeling? You feeling confident? Yeah. So uh, this is an archaeology poem and it's uh, a, a little bit saucy as well. If that's the right word. South Shields Roman Fort. It's the first place I did my archaeology. We're turning earth to find the Holy Grail, which Richard says is buried in South Shields. He's back from cycling the world, an emperor in the sight hut. And we owe him this. Richard, who carves startling fuck spoons, a variation on the Welsh love spoon, is notorious for seeing grails in graveyards, forts, and once, admittedly whilst pissed, the chip shop in Harbottle. His innocence makes him impossible to doubt or to distrust. Gaines, our own world-famed numismatist, despairs of this, as of much else since Mrs. Gaines was murdered. Fingering the thumbnail coins, denarii, decumani, looking at the obverse. Grief leaves him with a perfect mind for coins, for catalogues, unchallenged certainties. Everything is post or pre, defined by one event fixed as a rocking horse. The Roman sewers flush with rain and from the cess give up a flattened ring with lovers' names. It's not the grail, but something glimmers in the mud for Gaines with his unfastened heart and Richard with his bulbous spoons. They were ghastly spoons. You wouldn't have wanted to eat off them, I can tell you. Um, so I've been writing um, a little bit more sort of serious and um, textual stuff. I come from two places, really, from a, a place of, of seeing a lot of spoken word and borrowing from that tradition, but also a deep textual love of, of Norman McCaig in particular, who writes so simply that it's barely poetry at all sometimes, and yet it's fantastic. Uh, so now I've set myself up for a fall. Uh, this is a poem called Crates. Observe that when I speak of crates, your mind provides one straight away. Likely, you are thinking of the fruiterer's crate, a shallow, slattered box of rain-matted pine, the archetype of apples stenciled on the side, a cartouche slot above it for the grocer's hand. Your crate may be the sturdy plastic tub of the eco-minded council, waiting at the gate with all its rinsed tomato cans and, in this case, a drowned frog. Or then again, the solid, beer-smoothed wood hefted by the publican with its hungover slope of bot slump of bottles to the sunny yard the morning after. Your crate, in fact, exists as soon as it is thought. Its shape is shown in speaking of it. Now, let us speak of love. Oh, the poetry noise. Mm. Um, I, I have been canal laureate, a position of great authority, which probably only three people in the country are eligible for, and the other two were probably out when they rang. Uh, so, I was asked to write about uh, locks, which, canal locks, which of course I see daily living on a boat. Um, and you know when you know something very well, it becomes very hard to write about it. Uh, because you, you don't want to befuddle people with too much knowledge, but you also don't want to patronise them. 
So I tried to explain the mitred lock, and this is my best effort. It's called lifted. The land says, come uphill. And water says, I will, but take it slow. A workman's ask, and nothing fancy, will you? Here's an answer, engineered. A leisurely machine, a box of oak and stone. The mitred lock, the waters, yes. We're stopped. The bow bumps gently at the bottom gate and drifts. All water wants, all water ever wants, is to fall. So we use the fall to lift us, make of water its own tool, as simple as a crowbar or a well-tied knot. Open up the paddles, let it dam and pucker, lift and with it lift us like a bride, a kite, a wanted answer, breath no longer held, or like a boat. We're on our way and rising. Water rushes in like fools. These tonnages that slip across the sill, all dirty bottle green and gathering into a giddy hurl, then slower, slow, until it ends in glassy bulges, hints of aftermath, a cool, and thorough spending. Wait then for the shudder in the gate, the backward drifting boat that tells you there and here are equal, an imbalance righted. Ask of water, help me rise. And water says, I will. Oh, it's all very reverential and quiet now. Let's mess that up a bit, shall we? Um, let's have a poem about ducks and gangrape. Um, has anyone ever seen ducks having sex? I mean, obviously some people must have, but uh, just wondered if anyone here had. Uh, it's not a consensual act, really. It's a deeply, deeply unpleasant thing. And if you live on a boat, you see it quite a lot. It's all rather revolting. Um, so this is about ducks, and it's called Oix. The walk may be Churchillian, chin in and belly first. You don't fool me, you water cockney mallards with your nightclub swagger. I've seen you fucking in the shallows, shouting like a bus stop drunk at 3 a.m. Your drab and scrawny twockers cruising for an open door, on patrol and on the ante, cocky as the little boats, common as muck. Over here, lads, there's some bird with a sandwich. Don't give us plate-scraped lettuce, couscous, scraps of rocket, for Christ's sake, we want bread and none of your granary shit. <laughs> what do we want, bread? When do we want it now? And now? And now? Lunchtime, you're hungover, slouching on the bank and muttering. At midnight, up for anything, a new tattoo, that stripe of Primark colour on each wing. That old-fashioned gang rape every spring. She's down. Get in. <laughs> you won't get that from Alice Oswald. <laughs> Sorry. It all gets a bit more sophisticated now. Well, you're the judge of that. Um, so I can't, of course, touch what Alice Oswald does in writing about rivers. But uh, I have written about the Seven, not the great epic piece that she wrote in Sleepwalk on the Seven. But a little piece. This year, last year, I should say now, I travelled from Wiltshire, where I was briefly living, back up to the Midlands. And I came up the Bristol Channel to do that, which is fairly hairy in a narrowboat. Uh, and when you finish that journey, you're looking down on the Severn, which is this just immensity of water. It, it made me think of Shakespeare um, and um, the bark that, uh, ba you know, that looks on Tempest and is never shaken, because the bark, of course, is a boat. So this is seven. Don't take my lightness lightly. There is gravity behind it. This slow fix, this great meander that supplies the land's great wants, this fluid strength is what we borrow, what we lean against when love inhabits us. It alters when it alteration finds all right, and so it should. The bark's the thing, the dot, 
that battles tides and if the river lets it, makes its small, unlikely win. Um, I've been working with um, a fantastic uh, artist called Alistair Cook, who uh, makes wonderful films and film poems. And if you, if you Google film poem, you'll find his fantastic uh, short films of contemporary poets. He did a book of double exposure photographs and asked me to write 44 short poems to go with them. And I explained to him that that was not going to happen. But he could have six shortish ones. So I invented a, a form called the Decimal Sonnet, uh, which is ten lines and therefore easier to write than a sonnet. Um, and they're all basically about elements of nature. So I'll read you a couple of those. And the titles are taken from the Victorian naturalist John Muir. This first one is kind of about the sea. Every wild lesson a love lesson, not whipped but charmed into us. Come quickly, one foot to the grass and then the other. Hurry from your clock-filled room towards the sea, the air that bowls along the bramble-ragged lanes to chivy yellow flowers, exulting in the oceans of itself, wind-whipped and piney as a forester. You'll feel the salt scales building on your skin, uncivilized at last and clean as mussel shells. The shore lays out a mass of bladder rack, a skimming stone for every pocket. Come fast across the wind-played sand to harvest these, the sea, the sky, my shaking hand. Um, and this is the other one I'm going to read you from that sequence. Not even from high mountains does the world seem so wide. Uh, if any of you are real poetry nerds, and I feel that I'm in, in good company there, there's likely to be a few, uh, I can explain how a decimal sonnet works uh, later on if you want. A world that holds both porpoises and strawberries is wild enough. The rest is background noise. Red buses, pavements, currency. Ankle deep in sand and clean of other company, we only hear the wind. Crash and pummel, clout and cuff, the air is exercised. It burls around the bay in thunderclaps. We're giddy and handfast, hair lifting from our collars in the breeze. This, then, is all the noise that counts. We understand those pebbles in the bathroom stand for storms. Things change. Now, don't just stand there. Sing. Um, I've set my magic timer to, to ding in an interesting way at 20 minutes, so I think I'm all right, but uh, if Ed, Edmund's looking quite calm, so I'll just, you know, keep going. Um, I was asked to write a poem uh, about my best friend's 20th anniversary. Now, you, you'll all know this, this sentence. It begins, you're a poet. Yeah, a lot of heads nodding there. And then they say, we've just had this baby or got married or Uncle... Bob has just died. Okay, no pressure. We want you to write the best poem you've ever written for next Tuesday. Okay. Um, I didn't write the best poem I'd ever written, but I did try to write about a long, long relationship. So this is called Working Pair. I've asked for a poem about love. The woman I have asked to write this poem knows nothing about love. Of boats, she knows a little. When she tries to write of love, it often looks exactly like a boat. She tried to write a piece that might do justice to love between the lovers she herself loves most. Yourself, my love, and me. And which would reference the day you made my house a forest of blue iris. A day of kites and sculpture. When the dusk came down at five o'clock, and in it, if we looked, we would have seen two laughing boys, not ready to arrive that day, but ready, when they came, for you. The woman I asked to write this poem knows nothing of all that. Of you and me, she knows a little. So, she found herself remembering a rusty day in Birmingham, from an arm of water known and so invisible, to all the city drinkers came the slow nose of a narrowboat. Aries, heading for the old turn junction at an angle made for public pain. 
But then behind her, shark smooth, slid the snub-nosed malice, hitched on short lines, so that both boats took the gunner in a perfect coupling, right as knee or elbow. The first was pushed around the narrow turn. The second paused, then took the rope, and both moved on. Each line and angle, each response and strain, was halved and doubled. This is, of course, a clumsy metaphor. The woman I asked to write this poem knows that. But it is the best way she can find to show how moving, light or laden, two bodies could help each other so that both are more than helpful. Each is needful to the other's safe passage. She cannot write a piece that will explain the love that I've laid down for you, my love, in Iris and in bramble season, through our 7,305 days of rush and rest, of paint and clay, of hills and homecomings. I had not known there was a home to come to till you came. Um, I'm going to read, uh, the, uh, Janet mentioned that I won this prize and I got, uh, I got to have tea and scones with Andrew Motion last week and he gave me uh, the Charles Causley Prize, so I thought I should read this poem which won it and which is also a bit seasonal. We've been, we've been lucky in that we haven't had ice. In every other way, we've, we've not been all that lucky really, have we? And the, the poor people of the South West, including Alice Oswald, you have to feel for them. So this is the icicle garden. You give me this your snow and blackthorn heartland, with its backdoor heron in the gill, your childhood stream that meets a river further on. The water races down as cold as Herod, runs full tilt till rapids break in little raptures on the rock. Every moss-wet hollow strung with icicles, a glassy crop as slippery as elvers on their first lap home. You lean into the clough and gather them, wet shoots and spikes, invisible asparagus that gives a snow pea snap with every pick. And bunching them together, hand them into my black glove, a posy of cold flowers in colours too clear to name. A wild bouquet. I take your gift and take you in, offering up a frozen sliver to your softened mouth. You split one from the bunch and show me how to tease a summer out of ice. Leave the bundle thawing in the tumbler by the bed. Uh, Caroline Hawkridge said, oh, that's a bit sexy for Andrew Motion, isn't it? Seemed to take it in his stride. Um, how long have I got? Am I, am I itching for time? Okay, okay, marvellous. So, uh, I took my boat down to Wiltshire last year, which took a bloody long time, and I was very, very annoyed when the man I had moved for, well, shall we say I moved back last, uh, uh, last summer, uh, and it was a long way, and I, uh, when you've moved far from home and you've made that investment in living somewhere else, you think, Do, am I in the right place? Should I just stay here? Wiltshire is a beautiful place. And I was trying to work out whether I should stay down there in that particular landscape or whether I needed to be somewhere with more chimneys. Uh, and I wrote this poem and it was as I wrote the last line that I realised I'd made my decision. It's a diet rich in birdsong. Don't get me wrong, the people are all right. The pubs are much the same as ours inside. Apart from that, it's hard, this ease. The fields are rich as leather, hedged and ploughed. There's fuck all in between. Maybe a Georgian brick and thatch affair, a coach house here and there, but no real villagers. Or where there are, the houses stand like strangers at a bar. The vicarage, the manor, strong and blithe, expecting sun. Their trees are scarce, but grand. They have no hills but slopes that you could draw with one curved line. Their soil is wide and warm, their weather large. I grant the bird song makes a blossom of your bones. The lanes pile up with it. It falls like wanted rain. For all that, there is no outdoors. The land comes to the eye 
unasked. Behind these high red walls are gardens, pear trees. I'm ravenous for limestone. I'm coming home. Uh, so I'm going to do one more, uh, which is, um, which is again weather weather related really and appropriate for Manchester at any time. It's called Drenched, uh, and it's about a Lakeland wedding. This is another wedding poem. This is other stupid friends of mine who asked me to write a poem for their wedding, and I wrote it at the wedding reception. I just couldn't write the poem, and then we all got drunk, and I sat down as they were all dancing to the birdie song, and wrote this. And I read it at one o'clock in the morning. So of course they were all they had the advantage, ladies and gentlemen, of being terribly drunk, and so they received this in perhaps a better spirit than you might. But we'll see. So I shall finish with this and say thank you very much for being such a patient audience. I am profoundly sorry for not being Alice Oswald. Drenched. A Lakeland wedding. On Weatherland and Crinkle Crags it looks like rain but we're not having that. By force of will we clear the clouds. A calm before our storm. The talk suspended in a half light purpled with wisteria and wishes. The sky is fit to split. Small wonder if it shudders with the weight of grace. And when it breaks above us like an egg, it's a release of upland blessings, kindnesses refreshed, a great huzzah of clouds. Let it come. We're ready for a soaking, welcoming the torrent as it drenches all our skins and never wishing to be dry. Thank you.